In today's lecture, we will talk about the components of our theory. We'll talk about numbers called scalars and vectors and matrices. So to begin with, let's think about scalars. Scalars are a set of numbers. They have addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division defined for them. So typical sets of numbers might be the integers, the rationals, the reals, complex numbers, or integers modulo 2. Now what modulo 2 means is remainder on division by 2. So the one way that integers modulo 2 are different from normal operations is that 1 plus 1 is equal to 2, and on division by 2 I get the remainder 0, so 1 plus 1 is equal to 0. The integers modulo 2 only mentioning because they can crop up in practice, for example, in communication theory. And only half of the course will actually work for integers modulo 2. So I want to be able to point out when we get to material for which these numbers no longer uh, work. The other important property about these addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division is called closure. A set is closed under one of these operations, if when I take uh, two members of the set and uh, apply the operation, I get another member of the set. So for example, with addition, if I take an integer and I add another integer to it, the result is an integer. Integers are closed under addition. Or for rationals, if I take a rational minus a rational, I get a rational. Rationals are closed under subtraction. Now, if you check closure for these numbers, you'll find that addition, uh, subtraction, multiplication, and division, if I want all of these operations to be closed, then integers fail one of these. Namely, integers are not closed under division. An integer 3 divided by an integer 5 isn't an integer anymore. It's irrational. So we are going to limit ourselves to either the rationals, denoted Q for quotient, the reals, uh, denoted R, complex numbers, well, we'll use complex numbers a little bit, we won't see them too often in this course, or integers modulo 2. And these operations, the properties of the operations, mathematicians call sets of numbers with those properties a field. So we'll use the letter F to simply denote whatever sets of numbers, uh, whatever scalars we are actually going to be using. The book uses R most of the time, but if you look, all of our computations are going to be in Q for the simple reason that with rational numbers, the computations are exact. Uh, now with real numbers, we only can use a certain number of uh, digits, and as a consequence, computations with real numbers are going to be approximations of the actual computations uh, that we want to be doing. And they would introduce another level of complexity that we want to avoid in this course. So most of our examples are going to use rational numbers. What we're going to do with those numbers now is we're going to form them into collections. So vectors are an ordered set of scalars. And each of the scalars we'll call an entry of the vector. And the position of that entry is going to be the index of that entry. So as an example, here's a vector with three entries in them, 1, 3, and minus 5. Uh, so a vector that consists of three scalars. There's a first entry, entry number 1, index 1, is equal to the value 1. The second entry, index 2, has value 3. And the last entry, uh, with index 3, has value minus 5. The way we'll denote these is to simply say that a vector uh, will have a right, uh, right and a left paren, and we list v1, v2, vn as the entries of that vector. So this uh, vector here has n scalar entries, and we typically write the fact that it has n scalar entries in some set of scalars f in the following way. The vector v, this next symbol means is an element of, is just one example that we picked out of this set. And the set here is made up of 
n scalars. So the number of entries n is the size of the vector. In our example over here, the size of the vector was 3. If we try and generalize that, now we have a matrix. A matrix is going to be an m by n rectangular array of scalars in F. And again, we'll call the scalars entries uh, in that matrix, and we'll arrange them in m rows by n columns. So here's an example. This matrix has two rows, m equals 2, and three columns, n equals 3. And it consists of the entries 3, 5, minus 2, 4, 8, and 3. The notation now is a little bit more complex. We have two indices to take care of. So we are going to write our matrix A, and we will list the entries in M rows, M, uh, row 1, row 2, row M, and N columns, column 1, column 2, column N. So my matrix A here has the entries listed in M rows and N columns. We'll denote that fact by saying that our entries are scalars in our field F, and we'll denote this with A is an element of uh, M by N scalars, uh, and we'll have the size of that matrix therefore equal to M by N. Now what distinguishes uh, vectors and uh, matrices, if you look over here, vectors have a single index, matrices have two indices, an index for the row and an index for the column. So uh, matrices require two indices, and if you look at how we ordered the indices, the first index here is the row index, and the second index is the column index. So I, uh, A sub I, J, uh, is an element in the ith row and the jth column. So what we'll typically write is that A is equal to open paren, close paren, with A, I, J between parens, and all that says is our matrix A has entries in uh, some rows and columns. The row index is I, and the column index is J. Vectors, uh, I can write as either a row or a column, right? I have a single index, and it doesn't matter how I lay it out. With matrices, however, I have a layout convention. The first index I always denotes the row, the second index J always denotes the column, and so this is the layout for a matrix. Uh, this is how we are going to read the indices out. Now we are going to have a notation uh, convention. I've already used it, but let me point it out to you. Namely, Greek letters are typically going to be scalars. So alpha, beta, gamma, etc. are scalars. If the scalars are inside a vector or inside a matrix, we'll typically use the vector or matrix name in lowercase, and the index here is going to be the index. So, so A sub 4 is the fourth entry in a vector called A. A sub 2, 3 is entry uh, in row 2, column 3 of a matrix called a as well, uh, although typically the matrix, uh, as you'll see here, is in capital letters. So uh, scalars are Greek letters. Vectors will denote with Latin lowercase letters. And matrices will typically denote with uppercase Latin letters as well. Now there are some special cases of matrices that we want to discuss at this point. Uh, so. The first special case are matrices that have just one row or just one column. Okay, they're a little bit special. Uh, so my definition is a row vector. Even though that has the word vector in it, what row vector means is a matrix. So a row vector is a matrix that has one row and however many entries in the columns it might have. So a row vector is a matrix of size 1 by n. Similarly, a column vector only has a single column, uh, m entries, so m rows, and one column. As an example here, here's my matrix A. It just has three numbers in it, 3, 9, and 5, in a single row. And I have to make a decision as to what my uh, field is over here. 
I chose it to be rational numbers. So 3 divided by 1, 9 divided by 1, 5 divided by 1. So I have a row vector, uh, a matrix of size 1 by 3 from the rationals. The notation here is that A is the first index, is the row index. So the row index is constant, it's 1. A sub 1, 1, A sub 1, 2, and A sub 1, 3 are the three numbers in that first row, in that row number 1. With a column vector, it's the same thing, but now with columns. And so my matrix now has size 3 rows by 1 column. And if I look at the indices, well, now it's the second index that's constant. It says I have a single column, index 1. And my entries are A11, A21, and A31 for the numbers 3, 9, and 5, respectively. For a vector as opposed to a matrix, well, I'll choose a vector with the same entries, uh, uh, same scalar numbers uh, for their entries, so 3, 9, and 5. This is a vector in Q3, a vector of size 3 with entries V1, V2, and V3. And if you say that all pretty much looks the same, and the distinction is just how I'm choosing my indices, you're right. And what's going to happen is that even though as entities, as mathematical objects, they're distinct, they're very often going to drop indices or add indices as needed. So the first remark to make is that row vectors and column vectors, they're matrices, and therefore they have a layout convention. Vectors don't. So a row vector is indeed a matrix in a single row. A column vector is a matrix in a single column. And with a vector, I could write it as a row or as a column. They're going to silently convert uh, row and column vectors uh, to vectors uh, and back again. So for example, here, my vector v1, v2, v3, I could think of as a row vector and therefore a matrix of size one row by three entries by adding another index the row index uh, simply pulling the row index in front of the indices of my vector or i could make it into a column vector by adding a column index uh, to the indices of the vector and we'll typically do that without mentioning it uh, so I'll try and point it out a couple of times, but it's going to be automatic. So we're going to have a convention, though. When we take a vector and we want to make it into a matrix, we will normally convert it to a column vector, okay? unless otherwise specified. But if we don't say, then that's what we'll do, a column vector. An even more special case is if I have only a single scalar. So here's my matrix A. It has one row and one column, and therefore just a single entry in it. By dropping either the first or the second index, I get a vector, a vector of size 1 with a single index in it. And if I drop that index, I get the scalar. So from a matrix of size 1 by 1, we can go to a vector of size 1 to a scalar. And of course, we can go back again. So this notation here, paren 5 paren, could be a matrix of size 1 by 1, a vector of size 1, or, if I drop all the indices, just a number 5, just a scalar. The other kind of special matrices that we're going to look at are the zero matrix and the identity matrix. The zero matrix is quite simple. It's a matrix all of whose entries are zero. So here... It's a matrix of size 2 by 3 in this case. Each entry is equal to 0. And we'll use the symbol 0 uh, for it. Uh, so 0 by itself could be the scalar 0. It could be a vector 0 with some 0 entries in a vector. Or a matrix 0 with whatever shape the matrix is. And we'll use that same symbol 0 in all of those cases. The other uh, special matrix that we have is the identity matrix. The identity matrix looks like this. First of all, it has to be square, okay? n by n. Here it's 3 by 3. The entries 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, here on the main diagonal, 
they have to be equal to one. And all the off diagonal entries, all the other entries have to be zero. So that's an identity matrix of size uh, three by three in this case. And again, the symbol that we are going to use is the same symbol, no matter what the size of the matrix is. Uh, so I is an identity matrix. A one by one identity matrix is just the matrix with the single scalar one. And therefore a one by one identity matrix we can think of as just the scalar. Now, as I remarked, therefore, the size of the zero matrix or the identity matrix uh, isn't specified. We use the same symbol. But it's usually going to be clear from context what the size has to be. We'll denote the matrices 0 and i, the, uh, regardless of their actual size, except when I want to be precise. Right? If I really want to tell you, hey, my zero here is a matrix of some size, I'll give it a subscript. Zero subscripted with two by three is a matrix, is the zero matrix of size two by three. For the identity matrix, since it's square, a single subscript is enough, or two subscripts just to be consistent. So I sub three is going to be an identity matrix of size three by three. I sub three by three is the identity matrix of size three by three. You'll find both of these notations in uh, various now, in mathematics, a very important idea is to come up with a relationship between problems in different fields. And here in linear algebra, it's going to be two kinds of problems, problems in geometry and problems in algebra. So, so far, we've talked about the vectors as uh, algebraic constructs with a certain number of uh, scalar entries. And now we want to talk about geometric representations of those vectors. Matrices will be a little bit more complicated to think about. However, they also will have an interpretation that we'll see later. So for vectors then, the usual geometric representation of a vector is an arrow, right? In 2D and 3D in physics and whatever other subject matters uh, where we use them, we get arrows as directed quantities. So for example, in physics, we have velocity and force, etc. They're vectors. We cannot represent vectors with more than three entries directly, but we can use our geometrical intuition and still think of such uh, vectors as arrows in some higher dimensional space. There's a second interpretation where higher dimensional uh, space doesn't bother us and that is the following observation. Suppose we have start with a vector with n entries. I have an index 1 and an entry v1, an index 2 and an entry v2, and finally an index n and an entry vn. Well, I can think of that as a function. A function from the index, index 1 gives me v1, the entry v1, index 2 gives me the entry v2, function uh, applied to n gives me entry vn. And so my representation of a vector. Here's a little bit of code. Uh, actually, it's in Julia that I've used to just produce a plot. So focus on the plot. The code is there in case you're interested. Uh, here's my vector. It has one, two, three, four, five entries in them. The entries are two, four, one, three, and two. And therefore, I can think of that as the function that starts from the index. So my x-axis has the indices on it, one, two, three, four, five. And my y-axis is going to be the value of the entry at that index. So at index 1, I have y value 2. At index 2, I have the value of the entry is 4. At index 3, I have the value equal to 1, etc. So now, in this representation, a vector is just a function at the integer values on an x-axis. The takeaway from all of this is that we've discussed a couple of important concepts, namely scalars, vectors, and matrices. We've found that they're distinguished by the number of indices. For vectors, we have one index that we need. For matrices, we need two indices. Then we introduce some basic vocabulary, the words entry, size, row, and column. And we've discussed some special matrices, and that those special matrices are based on shapes 
and patterns of the enters in, inside those shapes. So think the identity matrix. So special matrix is discussed through a row vector, column vector, the zero matrix, and the identity matrix. And what will happen is that in practice, there are many, many matrices that have very distinctive uh, patterns to the entries. And so what I've done here is I've simply given you a link to Wikipedia. If you search for the list of named matrices, you get a huge big list of uh, matrices in the patterns of the entries that these matrices have to have, and then they get a special link. So I hope you go look and find out a little bit more about special patterns in the entries of matrices.